I was a broke college kid. I was a broke college athlete, and I wanted to figure out how to make money, so I did what any kid does and Googles how to make money online. I was like, they could easily pay me $1,000, $1,500 a month, and it would still be the third most profitable lead source in this company. I did what um, I feel like most people would do, and I, I bought a 997 course. I brought it to my boss, and I basically converted them, my W-2 job, into a client. I struggled. I couldn't sell anything for the first five months. And at our peak, our highest month, we did just over $256,000. And so how did you start prospecting? How did you start getting clients? Yeah. So walk me through your DMs. How did, how did that work? Bro, back then. And what made you want to start your own painting company? Do you want the honest answer? Or do you want the, the YouTube answer? <laughs> how long have you had the, the virtual painting business for now? So almost a year. Last month we did just over 100K in sales. What is your sales process? Where do you want to start? <laughs> All right, guys, so we're here today with Mr. Eric Foz right here, who runs a painting agency. This guy has been running his agency and scaling it since before I started growing mine. In fact, I remember sitting down and trying to funnel hack him and trying to understand <laughs> how he gets his clients and how he's scaled so quickly. So, Mr. Eric, welcome on, brother. Appreciate it. It's awesome. Honor. So, why don't we start here, man? Uh, why don't you give us a quick background on you, when you started the agency, um, what it is that you roughly do, what kind of clients you serve? Yeah. I mean, the agency services uh, house painting businesses in the U.S. and Canada. So a little, little bit of a unique niche, but uh, services them with Facebook and Instagram ads. And then we also do some, some sales coaching and stuff. Um, kind of the way I got into it, I was a I was a broke college kid. I was a broke college athlete and I wanted to figure out how to make money. So I did what any kid does and Googles how to make money online, right? I was a, I was a full-time division one athlete. I didn't have a lot of time to work a job or do other things. So I was like, how can I make some money in the few extra hours I have on a weekend and whatever. Um, that took me down e-commerce and drop shipping. And I did that for several years. I never really had much success with that, but it taught me Facebook ads. Um, Fast forward a couple years, I transferred to a division two school closer to home. And now obviously going division one to division two, I have a little bit more time, right? So um, I start working for a remodeling company in the summer as an appointment setter, call in leads, book an appointments for the sales team. And I started working there as just a means to make some extra cash to then fund my e-commerce stores, right? Um, and as I was there, I noticed they were running some Facebook ads and I noticed they were god awful. So I weaseled my way in somehow and took over their Facebook ads. And in a few months, it became one of the most profitable lead sources this remodeling company had. And it was a big company, right? They were doing like 13 to 15 million a year while I was there. They were a very sales and marketing focused company. Um, you know, they had 10 to 15 lead sources at any given time. And it became one of the second or third most profitable lead sources in the company. So at that point, I was like, I saw a path. I was like, they could easily pay me $1,000, $1,500 a month, and it would still be the third most profitable lead source in this company. So I saw a path. And um, at that point, I had fallen in love with the game of business more than the game of wrestling, which is the sport I was doing in college. So I saw a path and I was like, I can drop out. I can start my own thing. I can chase this. I clearly can do this. Like it, the model makes sense. I can get results. I have the skill set. So I, uh, I dropped out. Um, I moved in with my brother uh, to save on costs and started going after this thing. Obviously, I, I struggled. I couldn't sell anything for the first five months. And I mean, obviously now fast forward four years later, a lot has happened since then, but that's kind of how I, that's kind of the origin story. Okay, amazing. So you had a, a little bit of a unique start where you actually worked inside a remodeling company. Yeah. And so you saw it work firsthand. You handled the leads from Facebook yourself. Yeah, I was running the ads, generating the lead. And then literally, it was really old school, right? So like a lead would come through and as soon as the email came through, it, literally a lead sheet would print off the printer immediately and we had to go like, go call it, right? Speed to lead. Wow. So I would see like Facebook lead come through. I'd be like, oh, that's mine. And I'd be calling it. So yeah, it was, it was a unique perspective for sure. I'd see the sales reps reports come back and they closed it or they didn't, what the feedback was. So yeah, definitely interesting feedback. That's awesome. So no, no high level following up with all the leads. <laughs> no, no high level following up with the leads, no advanced CRMs. As I was um, exiting and starting my own thing, they were actually in the process of getting acquired by a big company called Leaf Home Solutions. They do like the leaf gutter guards and stuff, if you're familiar with them. Um, so since then, they've put in a lot of technology and stuff, but that was kind of as I already left. 
So mm-hmm. I I don't think they're using high level. So <laughs> maybe they should be. We got to get him. <laughs> got to get him back as a client. That's right. So what made you? transition from being an employee who I'm sure the owner was very happy with Mm -hmm. since you were managing the leads, you were running them, plus you were doing the appointment setting. I'm sure you're doing an awesome job. Why did you choose to leave and start your own agency and effectively drop out? I mean, that's a much riskier route than just saying, than just getting a raise. I'm sure you you would have gotten that and just stayed in school. Yeah. um, It's a good question. Um, Obviously my my boss was very happy and it's funny. My boss actually tried to like really convince me to stay. He tried to convince me it wasn't going to work. Um, and that, you know, nobody else would pay me for this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And tried to convince me to stay. And it, it, I kind of resented him for it. Right. And I've tried to make sure I'm not that boss for my team members now, but, uh, but yeah, it was just that I had, I wanted to be able to do exactly what we're doing now. Right. I, I fell into the rabbit hole of drop shipping and online entrepreneurship and all that stuff. And I wanted to be able to travel and go to cool places and hang out with cool people and have unique experiences and, and all of that. Um, so I could have stayed, I would have loved to have finished my wrestling career, but I didn't enjoy his college. Right. I was, I was there purely just for wrestling. I was, I was there to be an athlete. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just saw a different path. And like I said, I'd, I loved the game. I fell in love with the game of business more than the game of, of wrestling, right? I still loved going to practice and everything. Like I still genuinely enjoyed it, but I was more excited about going home and working on my e-com stores and building ads and, you know, prospecting clients and all that sort of stuff. So I just followed what I enjoyed. That's awesome. You mean you're having more fun renting jet skis in the middle of Columbia than having a job and sitting in an office? I am. I, I am, believe it or not. Um, and look, I think like, so still to this day, that was probably one of the toughest decisions I, I ever had to make, right? I remember going through it for months and months and months. And what, what I actually did was I had, um, it's a little confusing in wrestling, like in, you, you have the traditional red shirt, right? Are you familiar with that? No. Okay. So like if you, if you're an athlete and you red shirt, you, you have four years of eligibility as a college athlete. Okay. So if you red shirt, basically it's saying you can train with the team, you can practice with the team, but you're not using a year of eligibility. So you're going to do five years, right? And that year is often used to transition somebody from high high school athletics to college athletics. It's usually a big jump, especially in a sport like wrestling. So get them used to the new pace, the new level of physicality, et cetera, before they transition over. So I redshirted. And then in division two, they have this thing that we kind of call it gray shirting. I don't know if that's a technical term for it, but basically in division two, it works a little differently. And you have not four years of eligibility, but you have eight semesters of eligibility, so what they would do is because wrestling is a winter sport and goes from one, you know, two semesters through, you know, both semesters, what you would do is you would not wrestle your first semester and not be enrolled in classes. So you didn't use one of your semesters of eligibility. And then you would do it the second semester so you could compete in the national tournament and you'd actually get six years, right? So you could actually get an extra year by what they call gray shirting. So I gray shirted that year. We also had a very talented team. Like we were stacked in like the three different weights. We had like a returning national champ. We had me in there. We had a couple other guys that were all ranked in the nation, like in the top 10 or so. Um, and I knew I may be dropping out and maybe doing this thing. So I actually gray shirted for my last semester where I wasn't enrolled in classes, but I was still going to practice. And that whole time it was one working on the business, but also just like mulling this decision over of like, am I actually going to do this? Am I actually going to give up my college wrestling career? Am I going to not get this degree? Like my parents are going to be pissed, you know, going through that, that whole thing. And like I said, it's still one of the toughest decisions I've ever made. But, um, ultimately what I decided was like, I will regret, what would I regret more? Right. And I was like, I would regret not chasing this and knowing more. Right. If I hated it in a year, I could go back and, you know, I'd still be 20, three, I'd still be totally prime age to be a college athlete if I hated it and went back in a year later, you know? So that was kind of ultimately what led to it all. Yeah. You don't have much to lose. No. Right. By going all in. So after you went out on your own and you decided to, when did you drop out? Is it, was it after you had a couple of clients or, or this was before, cause you wanted the extra time? Yeah, this was, this was before, um, this was before because I, I saw the path. I, I had done the math. I was in a good enough position where because I was, I was calling the leads, I kind of got promoted to this, like what they call confirming, 
which is like you're handling some of the higher level leads and you're running some of the marketing reports and stuff. So I saw the marketing reports, right? I saw how Facebook was at a 2% cost of marketing, which if you know, remodeling businesses is really, really good. Mm -hmm. So I was able to run the math and go, they could pay me a thousand, 1500, 2000 a month. This would still be one of the most profitable things. So I saw a path and um, yeah, it was about January of 2020 going into that second semester. At that point, it, the time was running out. I had to make a decision, right? From that first semester. Um, so what I did is I actually, I brought it to my boss and I basically converted them, my W2 job into a client, right? I was like, Hey, I'm going to do this. I want you guys to be a client, et cetera. Um, I did all the math. I, I pitched the owner on like a $1,400 retainer and he, he hardballed me to a thousand. Um, but I converted them to a client. So, so I'd started with basically one. I was able to start with one, um, and then try to leverage that case study and, and get more from there. That's awesome. So, so what happens? So you quit. You yep. have one client, you're making $1,000 a month, Yep. which is basically nothing. Basically nothing. If you, you were living in Cleveland at this point? No. So where I was going to school was in Ashland, which is a small little town between Cleveland and Columbus. Okay. My brother was living in Columbus. So I moved an hour south and moved in with my brother, he had a spare bedroom and moved in with him. Oh, there you go. So yeah, save some costs. Saving you know? money. Exactly. I love it. Okay. So how did you start prospecting? How did you start getting clients? Yeah. I did what um, I feel like most people would do, and I I bought a 997 course, and uh, you know went through it, and and I started doing that. I cold called for a while. Um, I was able to book meetings, uh, but I struggled to close anything. I, I didn't close anything for for months. Um, I ironically didn't start with remodelers, and I was like going after gyms and realtors and all sorts of stuff. I, I don't know why. Um, it wasn't until I joined a sales coaching program, like five months later after not selling anything where they're like, dude, you get incredible results for these two remodeling companies. Cause my job then did refer me to one other person. Right. So it's like, you have these two remodeling companies you're crushing it for. Why would you not go after more? I was like, I don't know. That's a good point. Um, but yeah, I struggled really, really hard for a few months. I ended up getting one more client from a referral. I ended up selling one other, like it was literally like a, I think like a $700 retainer that I had to take like four meetings to sell in person too, by the way. Uh, like it was actually a client from, uh, like local to that Ashland area. So like, I drove an hour at like 5 AM to meet this guy for coffee. He was a uh, builder right before he started wow. like four different meetings, like barely get a deposit. So yeah, I, I got a tiny bit of traction, but I, I was struggling, um, until I joined that sales coaching program and started learning there. Okay. So, so the 997 course, was that a social media marketing course or a sales program? Yeah. Do I, should I drop names or do you not want me to? <laughs> it's up to you. It's up to it you. Was, it was Jordan Platten's uh, course at the time. It, whatever, I mean, this was back in 2020, so I forget what he called it then. Yeah. Some of an A, Affluent, I think Affluent. Okay. Affluent I'm Academy, sure. as yeah. I'm pretty sure what it was called. But yeah, it was a 997 course. It had a guarantee or something that you'll sign clients or whatever. Um, it was very okay. It was very okay. Um, the sales style taught in there was very like, oh, today only we'll waive your setup fee stuff. And it was very like, you know, take it away one-time offer stuff. And it just, it wasn't, it didn't resonate with me. It wasn't a sales style that I felt like fit with me. Um, so naturally I didn't see a lot of success with it. Right. But uh, yeah, some good stuff in there. Yeah. But the weird part was I already knew how to run the ads from the other experience. So it's not like I needed it for that. I was like learning. I, how do I go sell people on this? You know? Exactly. That so, was the biggest bottleneck. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. You had the skills, you just needed more clients. So then you took a sales course yep. and you started getting better at sales. So how did yeah. that go you had modules did you role play in there yeah how did you actually get good at sales and also i'm wondering how long did it take you to sign on your first cold client yeah i do great question um so it, it was more of a full coaching program right it was rob quinn's program um back in the day um so it was it was yes course material but it was also coaching calls multiple times a week um and i mean honestly quite frankly like i just became obsessed with it um I studied it. I practiced it. I was on every coaching call. I was asking a bajillion questions. Sometimes I'd role play with them on the coaching calls. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, now you fast forward four years, one of the things I often recommend people do that really helped me um, is I'd literally role play like in my four walls in my bedroom, right? So like I would review one of my sales calls. I'd go to the coaching call. I'd ask a bunch of questions. I'd hear how they see it. I'd get the recording from that coaching call. I'd listen to how I said it. I'd listen to how he said it. And then I'd, I'd practice it out loud and I'd be like, no, that still didn't sound right. And I'd go and I would just get, you get 20, 30, 40 reps in, in 20, 
20 minutes, right? Until I got the tonality, right? Until it made sense. Um, and now like me and my team joke, it's almost like I developed the skill set of like acting. We joke that like I could be in Hollywood, right? Because it's like, that's what basically I was doing. I was practicing that skill set of getting the tonality, right? The cadence, right? The word choices, right? Um, just in my four walls, you know? So that way I could get those reps faster. So I think that was one thing that really helped me a lot, but it, it was just becoming obsessed with it. It was becoming a student of the game. It was being on every single call, right? Giving it 110% um, to, to learn that skill set. So that's awesome. So you just showed up, you took action and you practiced. I love that. I haven't heard of someone going that far in depth and yeah. me saying the same sentence over and over, but that teaches you perfect tonality. Yeah. A hundred percent. I would be you like this guy, same situation. Yeah. This guy said it in a way that I was like, that's awesome. Like that sounds great. And this is how I said, it. and I'd literally compare it and I'd say it. Sometimes I'd even record myself, right. Saying it and practicing it, like pretending like I was on a call and saying it. I'd, I'd literally, I even went as far as literally like I would say something and then I would pause for like 10 seconds or so because that's how long it would take the prospect to respond to what they were going to typically say there. So I'd get more of a realistic look of like I'd pause and then I'd say the next thing and like, yeah, all of it, right? It was, it was obsession. So. Okay, so you took this program. So what did you initially do when it comes to cold prospecting, reaching out to clients? How did you get, how did you start your journey in getting clients? Yeah, a lot of it was through... Um, like cold Facebook DMs, LinkedIn DMs, Instagram DMs. Um, you know, obviously we still do that to this day, but it's evolved a lot since then. And this is um, for remodeling companies. So at this point, yeah, you at, the, at the time we weren't totally uh, painting and it was just contractors, remodeling companies, okay. leveraging those couple case studies I'd had. Yeah. Okay. So, so walk me through your DMs. How did, how did that work? Bro, back then, I don't even know. I don't even remember. It's been so long. Um, what was the rough? structure yeah it was some like sort a couple of pictures and then slide in uh no you just add them add them and add them and slide in okay uh, on facebook yeah yeah it, right. it linked into like right. i said and there were tools to automate that there still are um but yeah some sort of question just engage the conversation not trying to totally sound like a marketer right but then after a couple questions right some sort of pitch message that also sounded ideally not pitchy right had some sort of pattern interrupt or something in there to make it not just sound like everybody else was the idea and then transition it to a quick little intro call, right? Get more information, warm them up a little bit and then book for a, a full sales call and stuff. When I was just starting out, I'd even just send a Calendly link and just have them book there. Um, but as it's evolved, we, we do more intro calls and stuff. So Yeah, absolutely. And so you consistently did that and took action, joined these Facebook groups and then just added random people from Facebook groups, right? Yeah, or sometimes not even from Facebook groups where we would literally just search for people okay. uh, or we'd go to other people's profiles that like were influencers in the space and their friends and whatever. So, I mean, we, yeah, but all of it, so. Okay. Yeah. And how long did you do that for? How many clients have you gotten from that strategy? I mean, we're still doing that to this day. So, I mean, like I said, it's, it's evolved a lot. It's a lot different now, of course. Um, but I don't know. I mean, a couple hundred. A couple hundred clients. <laughs> yeah, because again, yeah. we're still doing, we've been doing it for four years. It's still probably our top acquisition source to this day. So, Okay. And your first 10 sales calls that you did, I'm guessing you didn't close. And so you, yeah, that's when not. you were in the, in, the, in the sales program. And then you just kept evolving your process. Yeah, it took me like three months in that sales program to close my, my first cold lead. It was actually a realtor, wow. ironically. It was just something like totally random, not even the people I was, I was targeting or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it, it took like three hard months of just like going at this thing, right? Becoming, just like I said, obsessed with it every single day um, before it's like I finally made enough progress and actually closed something. And then from there, it just snowballed, right? From there, I think I, I had the confidence. I'd seen it enough. And then... After I closed that first one, I went and closed another like five in the next couple of weeks. Like just boom, boom, boom. And wow. Was, yeah, it was cool. So that's crazy. And how much were you charging at this point per month? Um, I think I was doing like a thousand dollar retainer and like five hundred dollars in ad spend or something. Wow. So yeah. Five hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. For remodeling? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Usually you'd more than that. Yep. I found that out eventually, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, at the very beginning, I mean I I had no idea what I was doing, right? It was yeah. a learning curve. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you kept doing this consistently. You kept using Facebook, LinkedIn, all these group strategies. And then at which point, you said you're still doing that now. Yeah. And 
talk to me about your team. So when did you start hiring people? Because in the beginning, it was just you, right? You branched yeah. off on your own. You got a couple of clients. Your job referred you to someone else. Yep. How did you start hiring people? How many clients did you have when you hired X person or Y yeah. person? Um, so I hired my first person. It would have been like November of 2020. Um, I had probably somewhere between like eight to 15 clients. Like not a bunch, but enough. And uh, I'd been in some of these coaching programs. So I had seen people with bigger teams, people with appointment setters and closers and everything. And I'd realized that some of my time was now getting taken up with client delivery. And then, you know, I was setting and I realized I was like, have a full day of setting. I'd book a bunch of calls for myself. And then I'd have those calls because I had those calls and I didn't have any appointments the next day. Right. So I was kind of going like this in terms of my actual sales appointments because my day would be full of calls. So I wouldn't actually have time to set anything. Um, so I hired an overseas VA to do some of the setting. Um, and ironically, that team member is actually still with me today doing much different things because she actually has a degree in graphic design. So she was appointment setting. She did a great job. Like I taught her all the frameworks. I coached her on it. Um, she did a phenomenal job, but ultimately like that wasn't where she was going to succeed and thrive. Uh, she had a degree in graphic design. So she kind of did a couple websites on the side. She redesigned her logo on the side and it was like, dang, this girl's pretty freaking good at this. So eventually then our second hire was a US based appointment setter and we moved her over into a more graphic design creative role that actually like fit her strengths and developed her further and all that. So, um, that was kind of how that all had started though. Okay. And so her appointment setting, how did that work? Did she do it from her Facebook account? Was she logging into no, yours? she was logged into mine. Yep. Okay. She'd log into my account and follow our DM framework and ask me if she had questions. And she, obviously she, she's overseas and uh, she has you know good English, but she, she's not a salesperson, right? And I, I knew that when hiring her and everything, that wasn't the intention. So she would set up intro calls for me, like 15 minute intro calls. I would still take the intro call. And, and that's how we were doing that initially. I see. So she was the one then going into Facebook groups, adding people, yep. sending that initial message. Yep, exactly. Sending all the messages and booking them, booking them for a 15 minute call with me. That's crazy. That's, that's exactly what I did as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then when did you, who was your second employee? I'm guessing a media buyer? No, my second employee was a US-based setter. Okay. Right. Um, after, so, after that. Yeah. I hired a US-based setter and then moved her over. And then, um, no, I, I should, it should have been a media buyer, but then my third hire was actually a closer and he ended up not working out for a bunch of reasons, right? He was only on the team maybe a month or so. But um, we saw during that period where I was closing some, he was closing some, the amount of sales coming in was ramping up that it was like, all right, I can't do all I was waking up at 3 a.m. to do build outs and new client campaign build outs and stuff prior to, um, you know, starting the workday and stuff. And it was, it, it became a lot. So when that salesperson kind of uh, blessing in disguise didn't work out, then we were like, all right, we're going to hire a media buyer first before hiring a closer, et cetera. And kind of built more that way. So it seems like it was, it was pretty smooth. Then you getting clients, you started closing more clients. Then it was really just, just a hiring play. Right? Having enough team in place to fulfill on all the services. How did you think about growing your company from there? Whew. I'm not sure I thought about it much. You know, I think it was, you know, just like, Hey, what, what roles are needed, right? It was, it was all moving so fast. Right, it all happened so fast once I had learned sales, really. Um, so I think it was really like, where are we bottlenecked? Where do we, what's, what's holding the company back right now, right? What do we need? What am I not great at? What makes the most sense? What's the easiest role to replace right now? As my time started getting stretched as I was doing certain things, it was like, all right, I can teach somebody how to media buy. This isn't that hard. It's pretty templatable. It's a lot of the same stuff. I can film a Loom video, delegate it. Um, so there wasn't a lot of method to the madness, you know? Um, Ironically, and I, I know we probably won't get into this and we don't need to, but like ironically starting the painting business, the second business has coming from that place of already running the agency, it allowed me to do that way more strategically and look ahead of time and go, all right, what is this org chart going to look like? What roles do I need? Right? What does this actually look like and map it out ahead of time? But at the time, I mean, no, it's just, it's growing quickly. And I'm like, shoot, I don't want to be up at 3am anymore building ad campaigns before my day starts and clicking in same freaking buttons every day, right? It's like, it was the same copy and paste stuff for the most part. So it was like, all right, that role makes sense. And then it's like, all right, you know, I can't, I don't have time for sales calls anymore because I'm on all these client calls because we got 35 clients now. I was like, well, we should probably hire an account manager, right? And it's like, so it was just as we were going, just figuring it out, just trial by fire, 
you know? Yeah. And when did you switch to painting companies after <sighs> roughly how many clients? Was it a big transition? Um, it was more gradual. It was more gradual for sure. I'd say probably about 35, 40 clients or so was when we niche down to just painting. Um, at that point, I'd met somebody in the industry who was like a little bit of a referral partner. I developed a relationship with. He and I had become friends. He referred several people. And I'm sure that in hindsight, this is also probably because they were his referrals. But like these people that got referred that were painting businesses were just awesome. Like they were so much easier to work with. They got better results than everybody else. And I was like, man, like this is, this is great. Like I like working with these people more. If we look at our results, they get better results. They're staying longer, et cetera. We should niche down just here. Um, in hindsight, like again, I don't, I don't know to totally know that the reasons I decided to niche down were necessarily like valid um, in, hi in hindsight, but I did. And that was kind of the thought process behind it at the time. So. I see. Okay. So you kept scaling, you met this referral partner and then he kept referring you painting clients. So how far did you grow that? And how many clients did you end up getting? What revenue did you hit before you started your, your own painting business? Yeah. At our peak, our highest month, we did just over 256000 in revenue. Um, probably about 110 clients or so, give or take a little bit. Granted, like as, as a disclaimer, part of that is ad spend, right? So probably about 40% or so of that was, was ad spend. Right. And how long was that since the very first day that you opened your company? How long did it take Ooh. to get there? Um, Roughly. A couple years. Yeah, I don't know. I could find the stripe and find that. A few years? Thing. Probably. Do you want to find it? it? Just the. Uh, no, it's <laughs> just, right. just a casual couple of Two years. years. Yeah, I mean it. No, that's it awesome, did. man. So. I mean that's that's very fast growth. Yeah, listen, it, it it all happened like very, very, very fast. Um, you know, as I was as, as I was telling you before when we were hanging out, like for the first time in a long time, um, with both companies, we are like really, really focused on sales. Where before it was like sales was not the issue. We were good. We were almost selling too much to keep up with. And like that was two and a half years of my journey. Where it was like, yeah, like, you, every, like you're selling. Like the sales process is great. Almost like too good where you're like, I can't keep up on the other side. Where literally there was moments where you're like, dang it, I sold another one. Because like you're like, I, I have to fulfill this. Right? And like that was always where the bottleneck was um, on the other side of things. So, Yeah. What is your sales process? Where do you want to start? <laughs> for, for the agency, that is. Yeah. So you book in. It's probably evolved over time, but now for the agency, yeah. it's you had you do you still do the intro call, then you do a yep. demo call, and you close on that. So two call intro close. intro call still happens. Still two two call close. Um, we don't call it a demo call um, because we don't do like a demo slide deck, right? It's much more. Of, I mean, I guess technically we it's like three slides. It's like a lazy man slide deck of just like it just goes over the deliverables. For in that we just switched that recently. For a while, it was just a Google Doc, literally, with the deliverables. Then the next page was the pricing and stuff. So it's much more consultative um, sales style, right? I don't, I don't love the demo decks and the today only offers and the whatever. It's much more constant. It almost feels like a mini coaching call, mm. and that's kind of how we frame it, even on the intro call, right? We frame it as not some demo. We're not going to present them their, you know, our, we're not going to present them our packages and whatever, but like, no, like we're going to get on a call and like, it will be like a mini coaching call. And we're going to like tell you what we would do if we were you, even if that's not using our services or running Facebook ads or doing whatever, but like we've done this enough. We've worked with enough painting companies. Like it will, and that's just our sales style that it is very consultative. You know, if my service isn't going to help you, I'm going to tell you, right. And I'm going to recommend you something that would. Um, so that's kind of how our sales style is. And, um, yeah, it's, just, it's very conversational. No big demo decks or presentations or anything. Yeah, that's exactly how we do it. Ask questions, give them the solutions. Yep. Love it. Do you have a rough template of how that how it flows for you? The, the, like sales, the actual sales call? Yeah, the actual sales Oh, yeah, it's weird. No, word for word. Um, every the, the whole thing through. I'm a big fan of treating uh, sales scripts as frameworks rather than scripts. Right. So like each conversation is obviously a little different. Sometimes there's going to be two or three questions you ask to chunk down things further. Um, and when I'm training my team and other people on this, it's like it's exactly that. Right. Where it's like this is a framework, not a script. It's meant to be moved and malleable and, and shifted and changed. Um, but, yeah, it's all written out. I mean, even today, if I take a sales call, I still have it in front of me. Every, like, why wouldn't you? Right. We're selling virtually. We can. It's, it's right there if I need it to reference. Yeah, you know, exactly. So. 
How long is the, the sales framework? How long is the it? Google like, Doc, how long yeah. does it take? Oh. No, uh, just how long is like the actual document? Seven, probably like seven, eight pages. Seven, eight pages. And you still do that on, on sales calls. Yeah. You go through it. Um, I mean, honestly, I'm usually, no, I'm usually not. Uh, maybe I'm like kind of scrolling down, just kind of like find my place of like, oh yeah, I'm in that part of the framework. Like at this point, I've, I've taken enough calls. Obviously, it's, it's, all, it's all memorized. Um, so no, almost never am I actually looking at it. But I think a good sales rep is always prepared. So I'm not starting a call unless my framework's in front of me, unless I have my payment processor pulled up, unless I have the demo deck, the three slides with the deliverables on it pulled up. Like, why would I start, like, why would I go into a call not prepared, not ready to take payment, not ready with my questions in front of me, right? Like, of course, it's just, it just takes three seconds, pull up the same tabs, you know? Of course. So. so your closing framework, can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah. So all I've done is, don't get me wrong, I've learned lots of different sales frameworks and ideologies and stuff from different coaches and all of that. But um, where I've really taken all of my sales frameworks to today is just based off of Hermosi's closer framework, which um, he's talked about it in some YouTube videos and stuff. Maybe it'll be in $100 million sales when it comes out or whatever. But uh, basically, he just created an acronym, right? Closer is literally the acronym. So C is clarify why they're here. L is label them with a problem. O is overview their past experiences. Um, S is sell the vacation. E is uh, explain away their concerns. And then R is reinforce the decision. So don't get me wrong, like that framework looks a little different for like our painting company versus our uh, marketing agency, right? Like those look a little different because there's other boxes we need to check, like decision makers and timelines really important in a painting company where it's not, a, right? So there's other things, but in terms of like, what are our questions going to fit in? They're all going to fit within those boxes, right? Before I'm going to start overviewing their past experiences, right? What have you done for marketing so far? What was that experience like, right? Tell me about how that agency burned you, all that. Before I get there, I need to know why the heck we're even here. What problem are we solving for, right? So let's clarify why they're here, right? Are we here because we need to grow revenue? I, literally, I was, I was telling you earlier today, I actually took a sales call for the agency today. And as I was in that spot, I, I didn't make him any offer because the reason he was here wasn't like he didn't need us. I'm like, what are you doing here, man? Right? Like, so see us clarify why they're here. That's the most important thing. Make sure we know what problem we're solving for. There's only going to be so many, right? If you're selling the same thing to the same people, there's only going to be like three, four or five boxes they fit in as far as like the main problem we're solving for. Then we can overview their past pains and experiences, sell the vacation, explain away their concerns, et cetera. So all of my frameworks now fit within that just because it's simple it's easy to teach to other people etc and it, it becomes a box to check not a script to read right absolutely that's awesome and what made you want to start your own painting company is oh. it because you just saw the success and you saw how well the facebook ads worked and how your clients were crushing it or do you want the honest answer or do you want the the youtube answer <laughs> give me the honest answer man. so <clears throat> not a lot of painters will probably watch this. Um, so the honest what? answer... A lot of painters follow me. Yeah? <laughs> no. <clears throat> probably no. none. Yeah, most painters probably won't see this. And if they do, oh well. Um, I tend to be a pretty open book. Um, it, there, there's a lot of reasons, okay? It, it wasn't just one reason. Um, you know, the, the public-facing answer is um, I had this idea for virtual sales. I went out and sold with one of my uh, paint friends, that same referral partner person I was telling you about. I went out and actually sold with him in Florida. And as I was doing some of this, like my only sales experience at that point was all virtual, right? All on Zoom, closing agency clients. And as I was doing this, I was like, dude, you could 100% do this virtually. I was, if you could figure out how to price it virtually, I was like, I could 100% close this remotely. And that was just kind of an idea that lingered in the back of my brain. I, I tried at times kind of trying to test it out with clients and stuff, but it was always like, well, they didn't like how I was going to position it or this or that. It always just became, there was too many hurdles, right? So we saw that. Um, I just saw an opportunity too, to, I, I had a lot of different like ad ideas, unique ad ideas I wanted to run, which again, certain clients were like, oh, I don't want to run that. I'm not sure I'm really willing to try that, you know, et cetera. So I saw that. The other thing, you know, that had happened is I had saw, you know, the difficulties of working in that niche and working in, you know, as a service provider, as a marketing agency, right? As a marketing agency, the, the dark side of it is like, you take a lot of lumps, man. Like you're always the person blamed, especially when you become the marketing agency and a little bit of the coach, right? So we started doing sales coaching originally as a retention strategy. 
then it kind of became something we were known for, which is great. Like, I, I love it. Like, I have so much fun doing it. But then when you're doing a coaching role with them as well, even if it's only sales coaching, you get blamed for every business problem. You get blamed for why their project manager quit. And you're like, well, I, this is not in our deliverables. No idea what you're talking about, right? But so I saw a lot of pains in the industry as well. And then as just all of it evolves, right? I'm like, dude, if I could sell this virtually, well, I can run the ad virtually. I can schedule the appointment virtual. Call centers have existed for a while. Well, if now I can sell the deal virtually too, what else is there to do in person? Just the actual painting. I can do the recruiting. I can run the recruiting ads. I can do the phone screen. I can even interview remotely if I needed to for a painting company. So it's like, what else is there to do remotely? It's, it's literally just painting. So at that point, right, what is every agency trying to solve for in terms of client results? Why do people start going to booked appointments? Because clients don't call the leads. Okay, so we'll book the appointments, but then they can't sell. So I was like, shoot, man, I'm about to solve this problem. If I can just sell it for them, I've infinitely, I've, I've, I've found the money glitch, right? I won the game. If I can sell it for them, now I just need them to go actually paint it. But then you're going, okay, but how does that actually work? If they just go paint it, well, I'm basically just subcontracting. If you're familiar with home services, but I'm basically just subcontracting it to somebody. Well, why would I do all of it for them and sell it and just give them the deal when I could just subcontract it and own the whole thing? Not only own the asset, but also get more profit from it. Also, the reality is because I did explore that route, the numbers just get very difficult partnering with somebody on that, right? There's not, painting businesses don't have a ton of profit. There's, if, if I'm to do all that sales for them and I'm to take enough of the revenue to pay for the marketing, pay for the salesperson commissions, pay for the recruiting, pay for the training of the salesperson, et cetera, there, there wouldn't be much profit left for me or the client at, at the end of it, right? Um, so it's like, cool, what makes the most sense is to just start, start our own. The other big reason is it was a hedge, Okay. I don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer here either, but uh, I was like, I don't know a lot of people that have scaled an agency like hard, like niche lead gen agency hard past 100, 150K a month. And they're still here five years later. I could maybe find like one or two from everybody I knew. And I just saw it as well as we kind of went through some drama with some of our clients is it's like, Yes, there's maybe a ton of painting companies, but usually the communities with these people are pretty small. And when you're running an ROI or biz op based offer, it doesn't matter how good you are, some people aren't going to see success. There, there's going to be a lot of people that, that take your course, right? That follow all that stuff and they, they don't see success, right? For one reason or another, they didn't have the right personality traits. They didn't take appropriate action. They didn't ask the right questions. They weren't cut out for it. They didn't work hard enough, whatever, right? So, the reality is when you're a very niche service like that, well, eventually that group that didn't see success, even if you have like a 90% success rate, that group that didn't see success gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger the longer you go. And when you work with a, in my opinion, more unsophisticated market like painting business owners, you open up yourself to some drama within that community. It just takes one or two or three of those people in that 10% to get really loud and be really upset about their lack of results or whatever. Right. And yeah, I think client success is something like we, we, cause again, for the first two and a half years, sales wasn't the issue. So we were hyper focused on client success and we still had to deal with some of that. Like that is just part of the game, but I was just looking around and I was going, I've been in this for three and a half years now. I don't know. Like I'm just watching people that came before me that got to 200, 250 K a month, 300 K a month, fall off, fall off, get burnt out, start something else, do this, whatever. And I'm just like, huh? So it was also a hedge. Um, it was a hedge from the point of view of painting businesses are very stable businesses. You know, how you run a Facebook ad right now is way different than how you ran a Facebook ad a couple of years ago. Like it is constantly changing, right? In some way, shape or form. Like the principles obviously stay the same, but iOS 14 and all that stuff didn't exist a few years ago. How you paint a wall hasn't changed in like a long time, right? There's painting businesses that have been around 50, 60, 70 years off all word of mouth, right? So once you get them off the ground, they can be very, very stable businesses, so it was a hedge in that sense. Um, and then last but not least, like I said, many reasons. Um, it was also a hedge from the point of view of it's just going to improve our marketing agency. Now I have real examples. You know, in the coaching, it's not just on theory and sales principles, but it's like, hey, I understand what you're saying, but last week my sales guy took a call the exact same way. This is how he handled it. Here's the call recording. Here's my framework. Here's my script. Here, let me share my screen and show you my interview document for painters. Right. So it also improved our coaching a lot too. So it, it was a lot of reasons altogether. Um, but honestly, the biggest one 
the most painful one that really pushed us to it was the hedge. The hedge against this marketing agency won't last forever, no matter how good I am. And that's, I, I say that knowing that's not totally true and knowing that's a slight limiting belief, but I saw that happening around me and I was like, this would be a good hedge. So. And so your painting company is the first that does all this virtually, right? Yeah. Um, there's been a bunch of people, not, not a bunch. There's been a very, very small group of people that have done what they call virtual sales, but it's much more like giving a ballpark price or giving kind of a bracket and then going and seeing it in person, giving them a harder number, or going and seeing it in person, collecting a deposit check. I am the first company I've ever seen that does full virtual end to end sales. Meaning we are signing a contract, collecting deposit, giving a price down to the penny all over zoom or over the phone. The first time we are sending anybody out to the house is like when we're preparing to paint their house. After you sold the project. Yeah, project already. already sold. And they made the payment or made the deposit? Yep, they make a deposit. Okay. Exactly. But that's also like, that's normal for, like even in-person sales, they're normally not collecting the $8,000 for the painting project. They're normally collecting a deposit. We're collecting that same deposit just via, you know, virtual. So. Yeah. That's amazing. And how long have you had the, the virtual painting business for now? Um, we started in April. Okay. Yeah. So how many months is that? Um, what, it's February, so March. Well, no, it's, it's fucking March. March yeah. <laughs> um, so almost a year. Yeah, because it was technically like the last week of March was when we started and I flew back to Cleveland. So 11 months about. Yeah, almost a year. <clears throat> almost a year. And I know you just hit a huge milestone. Yeah. So how much did you make last month from that business? Last month we did just over 100K in sales, which was a big milestone. It was really, really cool. That's now, amazing. Now, again, for everybody listening, like in a painting business, it's different between what's actually sold and what's produced. So we produced about, because you don't get paid on that until it's actually, you fulfill the work. Until it's done. Um, but yeah, we hit 100K in sales, which was really, really cool. Um, definitely a, a big milestone. That's amazing. I yeah. love to hear that, man. Honestly, dude, I'd say the bigger milestone is the fact that like, I'm here with you right now in Colombia. In the painting business, we had six painters out in the field today and a project manager painting, fulfilling work in Cleveland. And I haven't been there in two weeks. Last week I was in Florida. This week I'm here. And everything's been running smoothly, you know, knock on wood. Everything's been fine. We haven't really had any fires. I think that's the, almost the bigger accomplishment. That's amazing. I remember about a year ago, we were in Mexico. Yeah. And we were in a bus going to a cenote where we were going cliff jumping. Yeah. We were going swimming. We were doing a bunch of stuff in Mexico. And you were telling me about this idea that you had. And yeah. it's, it's slightly uh, evolved since the first time that we talked about it. But it was, it was basically this. You wanted to close remotely and then maybe even go into multiple cities and, yep. and expand it from there. So I love, I love to see that, that come to fruition, man. And, and here we are a year later and yeah. you've, you've made it happen. And here you are and work is being done in yep. people's homes. The walls are being painted. You're collecting money. You're making money while you're able to travel in a non-so traditional industry where it just it wasn't possible, right? Yeah. And you can, you've, you've made it work. You started with the agency and then you took the skills and you pivoted. Yeah. And look, I think that's something that's been very beneficial is the agency taught me, I think, harder to learn business skill sets, right? It taught me building a team. It taught me leadership. It taught me sales at a pretty high level, right? Um, the, the reality is like the, the level at which I learned those skill sets is 20 bajillion times ahead of the average painting business owner, right? It's a pretty unsophisticated market. Um, there's not a lot of coaching and training and, you know, that sort of stuff for it, right? They're typically, you know, most painting business owners start because they hated their boss. They started their own thing or their dad ran a painting business or they were a painter. Um, so yeah, coming in with those skill sets already, I think was a, was a huge advantage and it's allowed us to build something pretty special pretty quickly. So. Absolutely. And here you are. Here I am, baby. I love it, man. I love it. So if someone was starting an agency today and they're just getting started, maybe they're learning about agency services. Maybe they're just thinking about starting an agency. Maybe they already have a couple of clients. Maybe yeah. they're making 5K, maybe they're making 10K, or maybe they're just a brand new beginner. What advice would you have for them? Whew, it's good. That's a good question. Like, it, there's so much. Um, I think learning sales and learning leadership can take you a long way. And I mean, interestingly enough, I think those two skills are things that no matter how good you get at them, you're always, you can always improve and you, there's always more to learn, right? No matter how long you've been selling, there's still things you can learn and get better. And I think leadership is often the same way. Um, 
but I think those two skill sets go very hand in hand, and I think they can take you very, very far in this agency game. Um, so just starting out, I'd really focus on that. The other thing I'd say is, um, you know, I think a lot of times in the agency space, in the online business space, it's like there's this race. There's this race to get to 100K, you know, how fast can you get there, et cetera. And while that comes from a very good place, and I'm very thankful I had that mentality, it helped me break stuff as I went and figure out how to fix it later and everything, it also builds a much less sustainable business too, right? And I think there's a lot of value in building building with more of an end in mind. Um, I don't know if I share this with you, but when I was first like thinking about starting the painting business, I actually got to DM back and forth with Hermosi a little bit um, and kind of told him a little bit of just like my ideas, like where I think I should take this, like maybe we could scale to a ton of locations because we can centralize the virtual sales and everything, right? And one of the things he said that just always stuck with me is he said, build the first one with a hundred in mind, right? Meaning don't rush the first one to a million. Build the first one with a hundred locations in mind. So if the system isn't good enough, if you can't be removed from it, if it's not like if it's if it's if it's rocky and just sort of works now but wouldn't work at a hundred locations, fix it before you grow, right? And that's been so helpful in how we've been building this painting business. I think a lot of people have looked and they're like, you're, you know, relatively you've done it very fast, yeah, but you're also like you did it pretty slow given your marketing and sales ability. You know, why not? Whatever. And it's like the systems weren't good enough, and I'm trying to build it with a hundred in mind. They're still not right. We're still not there yet. Um, so I would also say like, yes, have that, the, the last piece of advice would be like, have that level of, of speed and focus. Like money does love speed, but also like, don't sacrifice quality of the business. Like also be building with, um, the future in mind of where it's going. Cause you'll build something more sustainable. You'll build a better foundation. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to ask a question that I should have asked earlier. So let's input this before he started. <laughs> rewind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. rewind in the, let's rewind. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's put in this clip before he started talking about the painting business. Um, this is me talking to my editor. Yeah. So editor, what? Get that. <laughs> <coughs> it's getting dark too, man. Look at this. We can't even see each other. I know. Oh, it's not going to look, it's not going to look good. Oh. Input it in. Dark. It's all right. We got AI now. Those, we got those AI. Editor. Yeah. All right, editor. editor. Bring, us, bring some light in. There it is. Um, he signs like the Jesus lights in like, oh. yeah, right. <laughs> so what exact services do you provide to your marketing agency clients? Because I know it's not the traditional just, oh, we run Facebook ads. Okay. Here's a high level campaign. Go. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't offer. I'm sorry if you hate me for this, but we don't offer high level at all. We don't what? do any, <laughs> we don't do any, uh, text message, drip campaigns, et cetera. We actually refer them over to, but you um, have high level. You just don't. Yes. We yes. have high level. Okay. We use it internally. We don't give it to our clients. I did it early on and I realized I was becoming a tech support company, which I personally just didn't. Again, I'm working with a very unsophisticated, unsavvy tech market, right? It's not, they aren't doctors. These aren't dentists. These aren't people that are using computers regularly. We struggle sometimes to, we've literally had clients that don't have a computer, that don't own one, right? So it was, it, we were becoming more of a tech support company and, and decided to pivot away from that. But our core services are Facebook and Instagram advertising. Um, again, just delivering them a lead, not lead nurture campaigns, not any of that stuff, but literally just it ran, ran the ad, here's the lead. Um, and then also coaching. And that really started as just sales coaching, right? Since that was the experience I had from the remodeling company and calling, booking appointments. Um, and then also I'd gone through all these sales courses and have gotten good at sales. Um, so that's where it started. And now obviously as we've grown, as you know, people just naturally started asking about other things, right? They saw... We grew an awesome team. And they're like, how are you building team culture? And it naturally kind of became more. And then obviously we started our painting business uh, back in April and that then just exploded the coaching side of it. Now people are like, how are you doing all these things you're doing with your painting business, et cetera. Um, so that coaching has evolved to more just like holistic business coaching, but I'd say it's still centered around sales. So you could say it's like that hybrid model. I know a lot of people are talking about it right now. And honestly, if I could go back and do it differently, I would have separated them. I'd almost have them as two separate brands, two separate things. Like you, you purchase one and you purchase the other. You have two receipts, two different company names, et cetera. Um, for and coaching and agency services? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Okay. So for the agency services, that's you running ads and then delivering leads. Do you also book appointments for clients or just deliver leads? Nope. No, we don't book appointments for them. Um, we, we coach them on like the call frameworks I used to use when I was working at Thiel's and how I trained. That's the remodeling company I used to work yeah. at. 
Um, so we train them on that framework. We train them on how I've trained other people. We'll help them hire and staff and train uh, somebody to do that, right? We'll let those those admins, appointment setters they hire onto our coaching calls to role play with them and all that sort of stuff. But we're not we're not doing it for them. I see. And then you were doing once a week coaching call or how many times a week? Twice a week. And, that, and that's group coaching. So you would get all your painters, all your clients jump on and ask you questions. Yep. Every Tuesday, Thursday. Interesting. And that was mainly around sales. Yeah, it started mainly around sales and it started just as open Q&A. Again, it's evolved a lot. Um, you know, so now every Tuesday is sales focused and we actually have our clients literally record estimates and I review it live and give them feedback. Wow. And then we have Q&A after. Um, and then Thursday is more structured training, which a lot of times it's sales, but it's evolved into more of that, right? Um, it's evolved into like our recruiting process for painters and our bonus structure for painters now that we're running our own painting business too. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I think you've given away a lot of information here. Uh, this, this has been awesome. I love your business model. I love what you're doing with the agency, with the painting company, all that. It's really cool, man. I look forward to seeing what else you build and how many locations you end up scaling to. Yeah. Uh, super cool, man. It's always a pleasure to, to hang out and chat and see all the progress that you've done. It seems like every time I see you, you got something new, something <laughs> new cooking, man. You yeah. got, you're, make, you're making more. You got clients. You got, you got a lot of stuff going on. So always. I think uh, it's time for us to grab some dinner here. I'm That's getting right. quite hungry. So Vamos. I appreciate you jumping on, man. Absolutely, brother. Pleasure. Let's do it. All right.